So in the interest of time and making sure that we have plenty of time for interaction and Q&A, I am going to go ahead and get things kicked off. And I'd like to do that by saying welcome to another MassMedic virtual program. I'm Rachel Robinson, Chief Operating Officer at MassMedic, and we're absolutely thrilled to be have you joining us for another webinar. Uh, if this is your first experience with MassMedic, uh, we are thrilled to absolutely to meet you. Uh, MassMedic is a medical device trade association representing medical device companies uh, in the New England region. We represent over 300 medtech companies, ranging from the two-person startups of the world to the Medtronics and Boston Scientifics. We represent them in a number of ways, including opportunities like this for networking and uh, thought leadership, as well as advocacy around uh, a number of issues. If you have any questions, you can visit massmedic.com to learn more. We would absolutely love to connect with you if we are not already. So with that, I am gonna get things kind of started with this particular webinar, uh, which is the opportunities for medical device manufacturers around remote patient and therapeutic monitoring reimbursement. This is an incredibly important program and topic. So I need to say thank you to BioTeam Medical for putting all the work into to bringing this panel discussion together. I know you're gonna learn a lot and we absolutely want this to be an interactive experience. So please feel free to utilize the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you can also absolutely raise your hand and the, the speakers will have time in each section to allow you to answer your question in real time. So please absolutely take advantage of that. We want this to be as interactive as possible. Um, and I, I highly recommend that you do that. I'd like to now welcome our speakers, Daniel Adler, CEO and co-founder of BioT, Michael Drews, president of Vascular Sciences, and Karen Lipschitz, CEO and co-founder of AIO Med. Um, I'm gonna turn things over to you, Karen, and say thank you and take it away. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel and Mike. Uh, thank you for being here with us. Um, Daniel, before we dive into reimbursement, can you please explain us? Um, what is actually a connected care platform? Sure, yeah, no problem. <clears throat> uh, so uh, first of all, uh, thanks for everyone to joining us and I'm really excited to be here. Um, I'm, as you mentioned, the CEO of BioT uh, and we are in the connected care uh, uh, business, basically transforming medical devices into connected care solution. Uh, so before we start focusing more on the reimbursement part, just to uh, put everybody in context here about what the uh, uh, connected care platform is and how it's related to reimbursement at the end of the day. So when talking about medical devices, um, everybody uh, assumes that, you know, connecting them to the cloud is, is uh, mainly around cybersecurity and privacy which are critical of course, and complying with the regulation, uh, but that's only uh, one part of the equation. Uh, the second uh, and third parts, uh, which are uh, not uh, less significant are around <laughs> collaboration and care. Basically the ability to collaborate uh, between the patient and the care provider and also the medical device company uh, in a way that uh, they can be exchanged both subjective data and objective data coming from the devices uh, and then at the same time also provide care capabilities. So basically to uh, directly engage with the patient and create personalized experience uh, based on uh, data that is uh, uh, being uh, processed and analyzed through different algorithms on the cloud that really completes the story and provides uh, a more holistic approach towards uh, medical device connectivity uh, and eventually enables uh, the medical device uh, company uh, to provide more value to their uh, uh, patients and to their customers. And when talking about the, the uh, medical uh, device itself, so um, it can be connected in different ways uh, to the cloud. It can be either directly connected to uh, Wi-Fi or uh, cellular communication or through gateways, uh, both the gateways that are basically our mobile phones, if it's a wearable device or if uh, it's a stationary device and then uh, can use uh, uh, other means of uh, gateway communications. Uh, and um, for, from our perspective, it doesn't really matter what is the communication uh, of the medical device or what type of medical device it is, as long as it has the transmission capability, uh, then it, it can be connected and uh, trans be transformed into a connected care platform or solution. And once you have that uh, platform or solution, then you can start offering a lot of benefits uh, on top of the platform 
uh, starting from continuum of care, moving the devices uh, from professional care environment to the home environment, uh, through uh, improving adherence uh, uh, to treatment protocols, uh, by the uh, uh, engagement, uh, direct engagement with the patient, um, keep the patients under surveillance of professionals uh, and uh, trained clinical staff uh, on an ongoing basis, provide early detection uh, of uh, different incidents and situations and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and eventually also comply and support with the reimbursement uh, requirements. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, Mike, reimbursement is in a state of evolution and rapidly changing. Can you shade light on why reimbursement is so important? Yeah, happy to do that, Karen. Uh, thank you for the question. And let me just begin by thanking uh, IoT for the opportunity to participate in this very important discussion today. And also, I want to thank my friends at MassMedic for also helping to host this uh, webinar. Nice to be working together. I lived in Boston for about 25 years before my wife and I moved to California about three years ago for a whole bunch of reasons, not the least of which is no snow. So nice to be working with my mass medic friends again. Uh, so bottom line, uh, reimbursement is uh, 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 about a lot more than just the money. Um, in fact, reimbursement largely explains not just what medical devices that we have on the market today, but more importantly, what medical devices that we do not have on the market today. What I mean by that is I work primarily as a biomedical engineer and as a regulatory consultant, but I also am uh, having to develop regulatory strategies that are in sync with reimbursement strategies all the time. We'll talk more about that later. But one of the first questions that a, uh, a potential investor, an angel or VC, uh, will ask a small company or a startup before signing the check is, is there an existing reimbursement code for whatever medical device that you're developing? And if there's not, meaning that you're probably developing something truly new or novel. And by the way, when I talk to people and they tell me that they're uh, developing a new or novel device um, and they explain to me what it is, within about usually 30 seconds to a minute, I quickly realize that there's nothing new or novel about what they're doing. And so about a dozen years ago in one of my very first columns, I developed sort of a litmus test. If, you're, if you think you're working on something new or novel, ask yourself, following three questions. Is there regulation on this? Is there guidance on this? Is there reimbursement for this? If the answer to any of those three questions is yes, then I hate to burst your bubble, but you ain't working on anything new or novel. So let me just repeat those one more time. Is there regulation? Is there guidance? Is there reimbursement? So long story short, if there's not an existing reimbursement code, and I'm happy to go into this in more detail, but as some of you in the audience probably know, Getting your product through the FDA and onto the market is, is important, but it's only one piece. And comparatively speaking, it can be a small piece of the puzzle. Getting reimbursement from CMS and the private insurers, that's a whole different animal. And one last thing that I'll just mention before we continue on, a lot of people, they complain to me the amount of data that FDA will require as part of a submission, a 510K, a de novo, a PMA, an HDE, whatever it is. Well, to quote a famous politician here in the United States, I will say to them, I feel your pain, but compared to reimbursement, the amount of, uh, it, sorry, compared to CMS, the amount of data that FDA would require for a clearance or an approval pales in comparison to the amount of data that usually CMS wants to see for reimbursement round numbers, you can kind of figure that for um, whatever amount of data that you need for uh, FDA purposes, multiply that by about a factor of 10, by about a order of magnitude, and that's how much you're probably going to need for reimbursement. So as I said, reimbursement is important, for, uh, is important for a lot of different reasons. It's not only just about the money. Thank you, uh, Mike. Um... As Mike mentioned, re reimbursement is essential and healthcare organizations uh, seeking to be paid through their uh, reimbursement uh, system find themselves struggling. So Daniel, is there a way to somehow help those uh, providers and, and ease their way? Um, So, so uh, yeah, but before going into uh, how, how we can help and, and 
um, how you can utilize a platform, a connected care platform to, to do that. Uh, let, let's first talk about uh, you know, the uh, challenges that uh, uh, comes when it, uh, we are talking now about specifically uh, remote monitoring uh, or remote therapeutic uh, uh, monitoring uh, in, in our case, uh, which is just one of the examples. So um, we understand that reimbursement is critical as, as, as Mike mentioned, uh, but we also know how difficult it is, it is to apply reimbursement processes and procedures uh, into the physician's workflow and how much they hate those processes. Um, you know, um, just few statistics, 20% of the reimbursement uh, claims are denied uh, or need to be resubmitted. Um, 85, more than 85% of the physicians describe that reimbursement that really puts a lot of load and burden on them uh, that actually eventually uh, harms them from uh, uh, treating their patient uh, in an efficient way and delays uh, processes. So um, in many cases, reimbursement becomes a real barrier when you come or, or, or actually introducing a new device to a, a physician uh, uh, will become a, a hurdle or, or a barrier uh, due to the uh, uh, issues of reimbursement. And, and many um, uh, device manufacturers are coming to us. Uh, okay, there are now the new uh, uh, remote therapeutic uh, monitoring codes uh, in place. Uh, uh, we can now uh, provide to the physicians additional revenue streams of uh, at least $50 a month per each patient and, and maybe even $100 or more per, per month. This is a, uh, a new revenue, revenue stream that they didn't have before. They will surely go for it. So, so basically, the, the first question that you need to ask, and, and that will be the first challenge to overcome, is whether uh, this 50, these $50 or $100 are really you know, uh, a viable financial uh, uh, stake for, for, for the physician. Um, and, and that can come from different reasons. Uh, maybe, you know, it's not that of a big money for him. And if he has only 10 new patients uh, that he, or 10 patients that he needs to monitor a month, that would not change the needle for him uh, or even 100 patients. And, and the question is also, what are the alternatives? What he is he's losing or, or missing uh, if he goes to this road and, and needs to, uh, you know, probably uh, uh, neglect other ones uh, because he eventually has a, a certain amount of time or this treatment comes in instead of a different treatment that he's already used to getting reimbursed uh, of uh, and can be maybe $1,000 uh, for a treatment. Um, but, but let's say you convinced him and, and then uh, yeah, you, you, you presented him a, a financial uh, uh, incentive to go with you. Uh, then of course you need to show to him that the, the load of submitting the, the reimbursement uh, uh, request is not high and to try to uh, uh, present a, a system or a platform that can optimize it uh, from an automation perspective as much as possible. So the current load on these people that are doing the reimbursement on themselves will not uh, change. Uh, and uh, eventually uh, to show him how you can create real value for him uh, by expanding uh, or extending their chargeable domains uh, and not losing the existing one. So, so that's the main uh, uh, challenge and story here. So Mike, um, we know that the development, the design and development process of a medical device is complicated and long. Um, from your experience, at which stage you advise medical device companies uh, to start consider reimbursement? Yeah, well, again, great question, Karen. Uh, long story short, as it says on the bottom of the slide, just like regulatory strategy, it's never too early to consider uh, reimbursement strategy very early on in your product development cycle. Uh, and let me give you a couple of reasons why I, I say that. First of all, as a former R&D engineer, uh, I started out in business about 30 years ago, working in, as an R&D engineer designing medical devices before transitioning to the dark side, in my case, not marketing, but regulatory. I learned that there's a lot of different ways that I can design a device to do a certain thing. There's a lot of different ways to skin a proverbial cat, for example. And just like I encourage my customers when it comes to regulatory strategy, the earlier that you bring me in as a regulatory consultant to help you with your regulatory strategy uh, long before design freeze, um, I think it's regrettable that a lot of medical device companies, they don't consider regulatory or even reimbursement um, until they get to the point of design freeze or, or sometimes even beyond that. And while I don't want to go so far as to say that that's too late, 
it certainly makes it more challenging. Why? Because it's a lot easier if an R&D engineer sits down with me and says, Mike, I can design this device to work in one of three different ways. I'd be able to say to them as a regulatory consultant, and similarly from a reimbursement perspective, well, if you take uh, you know, option two, that's going to make it getting through the FDA that much easier than option one or option three. If you, if you take option two, that's going to make it easier to get reimbursement from CMS and the private insurers than option one or option three. When my wife and I uh, lived in, in Boston and we uh, were finishing the basement of our home, uh, the contractor laid out where the, line, the, the, the walls were going to be on the floor in chalk. And he said to us probably at least three or four times, make sure that the walls are where you want them because while they're still in chalk, it's very easy to just rub out the line and move it over six inches one way or the other. Once the walls become built, we can still move the lines, but they come, but it becomes much more time consuming and expensive to do that. Regulatory strategy and reimbursement strategy exactly the same way. The earlier that you can consider both of them, regulatory as well as reimbursement, the less difficult, the less expensive those changes become. Alternatively, the further you get through the development process, ultimately to the point of design freeze or even commercialization, um, it becomes much, much more time consuming and difficult and expensive to make changes. The simple reality is I've seen a number of companies, including some of the largest medical device companies on earth, they'll get their device through the FDA and onto the market only to come to find that nobody can use it because nobody can pay for it because EMS doesn't reimburse for it and the private insurers don't pay for that. It's, a, it's, a, it's surprising how often that happens. And yet I think that's uh, an elementary school mistake. That should absolutely never happen if you consider both regulatory as well as uh, reimbursement as early in that process as possible. Does that make sense, Karen? I, yeah, and, and actually, um, it's a good point. So assuming we pass the, the uh, barrier of uh, developing a device and designing a device and going for regulation, um, we are back into the financial viability. So Daniel, um, how to build uh, a financially viable solution? Yes, so again, uh, and going back to what M Mike said, uh, uh, once you, you uh, uh, lay down all the infrastructure in place from, from day one, uh, which is critical, and you understand what you are trying to target, and you already, let's say again, let's talk about uh, remote therapeutic uh, monitoring uh, as an example, you decided this will be your uh, main uh, 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 business or, or your business model will be based on uh, that uh, revenue stream coming from uh, those uh, CPT codes. Uh, then you need to see how you develop uh, a solution that complies with all the uh, different parts of, of, of uh, the remote therapeutic uh, monitoring uh, scheme. Uh, and uh, I'll get down to each and every details of that and how uh, eventually a platform uh, can support you with that. So, um, you know, remote uh, uh, therapeutic monitoring is basically uh, to uh, do uh, the collection of uh, uh, therapeutic non-physiological data uh, collection and uh, monitoring uh, and adjustments, of course. Uh, and basically that's a bit different than, you know, the RPM codes, which are mainly for physiological vital sign monitoring that uh, existed uh, before that. Um, and uh, also here, uh, it's not only by physicians that can give the treatment, but also by different stakeholders like uh, uh, physical therapists or even uh, uh, social workers or, or nurses. Uh, so you have different personas that can actually utilize uh, 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 the, the, the reimbursement uh, uh, schemes. Uh, and then you have basically uh, four different relevant codes uh, under that. Uh, the first one is for the initial setup uh, of the device. It's a one-time payment of almost uh, $20 in average. Um, and again, if you build a platform that can automatically uh, configure uh, and help the uh, uh, patient uh, to set up the device from remote, uh, let's say by sending him training videos or manuals, uh, uh, from the uh, cloud to the front-end application that's on his mobile phone, uh, then uh, 
you can uh, uh, be ready to utilize better uh, the uh, uh, 98, uh, 9075 code for uh, the initial setup uh, uh, part. Uh, and then you need to make sure that you are collecting the relevant uh, 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 parameters from the device. So you can actually later on uh, uh, point them out and, and, and report about them uh, when it comes to the uh, 98976 uh, CPT code, uh, which is about, you know, let's say, give an example. If you're using, if you develop an inhaler, then uh, how much time the patient used the inhaler at what, what the dosages and so on. This is this is information which is critical to collect uh, and, 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 and audit. Uh, so eventually you can uh, uh, get reimbursed on, on that code and, and receive uh, an hour of $55 in average. And then uh, the last the types of codes are the ones that are really enabling the monitoring of the patients for at least 20 minutes uh, in a month. Uh, and the overall, by the way, uh, monitoring should be at least 16 days out of the full months. So you need to uh, uh, provide evidence to that. So the system needs to constantly collect the data and, and showcase that the patient was monitored for at least 16 days for at least uh, 20 minutes. And uh, if he was monitored for more then there are another 20 minutes that you can be, get reimbursed on. Uh, and, uh, you know, even give alerts uh, in cases where um, uh, you're missing a day or you're missing five minutes. Uh, so you will know that you won't be, be reimbursed for the activity that you did uh, with respect uh, to that uh, patient. So um, this is how you can actually uh, uh, build a viable solution uh, from financial perspective by embedding all those capabilities of remote configuration, of remote training, of collecting uh, and auditing the, the relevant parameters um, uh, on the system itself and then uh, providing evidence to them. And, and, and once you understand exactly uh, uh, the, the, uh, how the CPT codes are defined uh, and you make sure that your system supports those workflows, then you will be fine. So, so that's uh, uh, one element out of, of that aspect. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, uh, for you need again one more point, which is important, uh, is that, uh, and we'll talk about it also later, is that you need to make sure that the system again is flexible enough to adapt to changes because sometimes uh, regulation is changing or new come uh, new codes are coming in. So you need to be able to uh, modify the system and have open interfaces that will enable you to uh, adjust it to. Uh, modifications that will happen in the future because you're developing the, uh, the foundations and the product right now, uh, but it will be in production maybe in three years and, and you don't really know what will happen in the market in three years. So Daniel, um, as complicated as it sounds, you are still talking about a product that actually can meet uh, the reimbursement requirements and can find a CPT code which fits. But uh, let's assume that, uh, Mike, we do found a product which is innovative. I know you find it hard to believe, but let's assume we find one. <laughs> uh, we know that innovation not always align with reimbursement. So I'm turning now to both of you. Um, can you please uh, help us understand what are the pro and cons of creating or promoting a new CPT code that's uh, trying to fit in, fitting in the innovation into a, an existing uh, CPT code. Um, is there a way to take a new and innovative uh, device and try to squeeze it into an existing CPT code? Great question, Karen. Uh, and I'm going to start by giving sort of the general response. And then uh, Daniel's going to share a, a specific BioT case study to illustrate further. So when a company uh, considers reimbursement, they, they have one basic question. Can we fit into an existing reimbursement code or is it necessary or would it be to our advantage to work with CMS to create a reimbursement code? As I hinted at earlier, especially for small companies and startups that are uh, relying on angel or VC or, or other kind of investors, the conventional wisdom is that you try to fit into an existing reimbursement code for a whole bunch of reasons, not the least of which is that it's easier. However, I find in some cases that kind of an approach can be penny wise and pound foolish. 
Um, so as an example, if we have a Me Too medical device, like a 510K, and for those of you in the audience that are not that familiar with the regulatory world, the 510K is the most common pathway, not necessarily the best pathway and certainly not the only pathway, but the most common pathway that medical device companies use to get devices through the FDA and onto the market here in the US. The essence of the 510K is basically we have to show that our device is basically the same, i.e. substantially equivalent as another device, what we call a predicate device already on the market. Well, it stands to reason that if there's another device that's very similar to ours already on the market, then probably there's another um, there's a reimbursement code that that other device fits into that our device will probably fit into as well. On the other hand, if we're developing something new or novel, uh, for example, we're not going to bring it onto the market as a 510K, but rather we're going to bring it onto the market as a de novo. The de novo is sort of the alternative to the 510K for uh, class two or lower devices. In other words, unlike the 510K, a de novo does not require a predicate. You do not have to show that your device is basically the same or substantially equivalent to another device. Well, if your device is going through the FDA as a de novo, in regulatory terms, what that means is that you're not similar, or at least not not necessarily similar to another device. Therefore, it stands to reason that there might not be an existing reimbursement code that you can fit into. Now, again, please notice I'm parsing my words very carefully here. There are many de novo devices. That is a device that comes through the FDA that uh, as a de novo and gets onto the market that fits into an existing reimbursement code. So I don't wanna say that those two things are mutually exclusive, however, when you think about it, I don't think it takes you know, an IQ much greater than five to appreciate that if in regulatory terms that you know, the device is novel to require a de novo, but in reimbursement terms, it's not novel, it can fit into an existing uh, reimbursement code. It's hard to connect those dots. It's hard to you know, understand that, but it does happen and it does happen fairly frequently. This goes back to what I talked about earlier uh, where it's so important to consider not just your reimbursement strategy, but your, uh, but your regulatory strategy as early in the product development process that you can, especially if you think that you have a newer novel device that might go the de novo direction. If you can get a de novo from the FDA and fit into uh, an existing reimbursement code, that's gonna make it much easier and cheaper and quicker and less risky to get your device on the market. However, I'll just say one last thing, and then I'll turn it over to Daniel for a, a specific example. As I said a moment ago, even if you can fit into an existing reimbursement code, doesn't necessarily mean you should. Even if you can fit, uh, convince FDA that your device is a 510K, doesn't necessarily mean that you should. There are very significant advantages to considering a de novo, even if a 510K is a possibility. And on the reimbursement world, there are very significant advantages of working with CMS to um, create a new reimbursement code, even though you might be able to fit into an existing reimbursement code. This is something I call competitive reimbursement strategy. It's a riff on what I developed years ago, competitive regulatory strategy. Long story short, I see it happen where companies can be penny wise and pound foolish. They figure it's easier to fit into an existing reimbursement code and get onto the market that way. But in the long term, they end up shooting themselves in the foot. They end up uh, making much less money because the, the margin on that product under the existing reimbursement code is actually much lower than the margin on the same product that would have been if they work with CMS to fit to the new code. So bottom line, just like in life, there's advantages and disadvantages to everything. And it's very important that you work with somebody uh, who knows what the heck they're doing, has a big picture view of both regulation as, reimbur as well as reimbursement to make sure, <clears throat> excuse me, to make sure that you're able to understand and consider all of your different options and the advantages and the disadvantages to each and every one. Daniel, can you illustrate further by sharing a specific example? Yeah, yeah, sure. So again, I totally agree, and, and I don't think that there is a you know a wrong or right answer, and there are different paths to take. And, and uh, the, the example that uh, I can give here is of a company called Itamar Medical. They're in the sleep apnea uh, domain, 
and they uh, invented a new uh, device, uh, sensing device that uh, um, was doing uh, sleep tests in a totally different manner than the common one, uh, which was, were based on uh, respiratory airflow. Um, and back in even 1998, there was already a CPT code uh, uh, for a sleep study uh, where you could uh, get the reimbursement of, I think, $2,000 uh, for respiratory, uh, uh, for a sleep study. And, and the, one of the main uh, sensors for, for the study uh, were based on a respiratory airflow. Now, uh, Itamar Medical didn't use the respiratory airflow uh, to get this, the results and uh, they did a more efficient way for that and, and used different sensors um, uh, for that, uh, like a, a, an arterial tone sensor uh, that uh, monitor the snores and, and, and uh, the, the position of the chest and so on. Um, so they had two options. One is to add uh, the elements of uh, respiratory airflow into their uh, uh, device, uh, although they don't need it for, for, the, for, for their uh, device to operate, but then qualify with the uh, existing code uh, or to go and apply for a new code. Uh, and it, it, eventually in 2006, they decided to apply for a new code. They started with uh, a category three uh, code and, and then eventually category one. And it took them uh, one year for the category three, uh, that basically you don't get reimbursed for, and, and then three years for the category one. So um, in their case, it took them three years to get to, uh, you know, to a market with a reimbursement code in place. And, and this is something you need to take into consideration, where today it's very easy for you uh, to take an off-the-shelf, you know, a sensor that is measuring respiratory or any other element uh, and comply with the existing code. Uh, and by that, uh, overcoming uh, uh, that uh, uh, problem. Uh, and, and on top of, of that, you know, uh, just to add a bit uh, uh, to the story, uh, their uh, test, you, you can do that at home and not in a sleep lab. Uh, it was much cheaper. It's around $200 per test uh, versus $2,000 when you do it in the lab. Now, again, looking at the physician, uh, you need to understand, or in this case, it's a sleep doctor, uh, what's his incentive to move from a uh, uh, a lab test that you uh, get $2,000 for uh, versus the home test that you only get $200 for, but it's a different story. Um, thank you both. Um, I would like to pause for a second and give it an opportunity for the audience to ask uh, a question or two, because there are a few questions here that are uh, related to what we have just uh, discussed. Um, and, uh, one of the question is um, if you have a mad dev uh, that uh, has clearance but no reimbursement associated with the actual product, um, can you still be paid for RPM? Yeah, I'll, I'll, well, I'll be happy to start. And then Daniel, if you want to add on anything, feel free. But simply put, I think uh, mentally it's probably easiest, <clears throat> pardon me, it's probably easiest to um, differentiate between regulatory clearance or approval versus uh, reimbursement. So they're, they're really independent of one another. Uh, when FDA gives a 510K clearance or grants a de novo or approves a PMA or what have you, that's totally independent of uh, CMS and reimbursement. FDA could care less about reimbursement. Yeah, there is a FDA CMS working group for uh, certain products that um, if you're working in an area where there is no existing reimbursement, but at the end of the day, and Daniel, feel free to add in here, um, it's up to the company to go to CMS and, um, and, and figure out a way to either A, fit into an existing reimbursement code so that they can get paid, or if that's not a possibility, then B, work with CMS to set up a new one. Daniel, what would you add to that question? No, uh, well, I'm totally, you know, behind you. I don't have anything specific to add on that. Uh, that that's the, the, the way to go. Okay. Thank you. I want to go back, Daniel, just uh, for a second to the statistics you mentioned uh, as for the um, reimbursement challenges. And um, I agree with you. According to the Center of Medicare and Medicaid Services, coding error results with almost okay. $29 billion uh, a year in uh, improper payments. Um, and 31% of the US healthcare costs are in administrative overhead associated with billing claims and uh, processing of claims. 
So is there a way to simplify and streamline uh, the claim process? So uh, the, the idea again is to use uh, uh, platforms which are very flexible that can um, align to the existing processes of the different uh, 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 care providers and uh, insurers. Uh, and as long as you, uh, uh, you know, uh, enable eventually the ability to seamlessly uh, integrate uh, both to the existing system that the customers are already using for the reimbursement process and uh, align with the uh, workflow of the reimbursement process and automate as much as you can uh, by, you know, uh, automating uh, the reports and uh, by uh, uh, generating the uh, relevant uh, alerts in time and, 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 and so on. And, and disseminate the data and, and making sure that you have an, an open platform with uh, what we call uh, APIs, uh, uh, application programming interfaces that enable you to easily uh, interface with uh, third party systems uh, uh, and, and, and support the new uh, uh, protocols around that, uh, then uh, that will eventually make your customer's life easier and, and your chances to, uh, for a sale uh, to be higher. Thank you, Daniel. Um, Mike, the real world data and, and real world evidence uh, are playing increasing role in uh, healthcare decisions. Can you explain the difference between the two of them and maybe help us understand what it has to do with uh, reimbursement? Yeah, once again, Karen, uh, great question. Thank you for asking. So both real world data as well as real world evidence these are uh, buzz phrases that are um, really becoming more and more popular in the reimbursement world, certainly in the regulatory world and in other uh, worlds as well. So in a nutshell, let me differentiate between real world data and real world evidence. And I'm gonna do so in a regulatory and an FDA perspective, whether or not the difference is applicable to reimbursement or other connotations, that is, I'll, I'll leave for a topic of a different discussion. But FDA does agree, does differentiate between real world data and real world evidence and, uh, in the guidance that CDRH put out on this about uh, three or so years ago now. And I happen to agree with them on this. I don't agree with everything that FDA says, but uh, in this case, I, I do. Real world data and real world evidence are both all of the information that is uh, known, all of the data, all of the knowledge, all of the evidence, whatever you want to call it, about your product after it goes through the FDA and is onto the market, uh, usually here in the United States. But here's the difference. Real world data is all of the evidence. As my attorney friends like to say, the totality of the evidence. In other words, from all sources, regardless of how reputable it is, regardless of how credible it is, regardless of how reliable or, uh, or even realistic it is. Real world evidence, on the other hand, is only that portion of real world data, a subset of real world data, if you will, that is of sufficient quality to be um, believable, to be reproducible and so on and so on. So simply put, real world evidence is a subset of real world data, not the other way around. In other words, all of real world evidence is in fact real world data, but not all of real world data rises to that higher standard, if you will, to be real world evidence. With that understanding of the differentiation between the two, from a regulatory perspective, FDA is now willing to consider, at least technically, as a guidance came out on this about three years ago, real world evidence as part of a regulatory submission, uh, usually in the form of a label expansion. In other words, let's say, hypothetically speaking, <clears throat> that you have a device on the market uh, for X, you want to go back to the FDA and do a label expansion. You want to add another indication. Let's call it indication Y. And let's say you need evidence. You need clinical data to support that. Well, you basically have two options. One is you can do a randomized clinical trial, an RCT. That's considered to be the gold standard, which, oh, by the way, I think the RCT should not be considered the gold standard because it is just unrealistic of how we do med how we practice medicine in the real world. The other thing, the other option that we have is to consider if we have real world evidence. In other words, what I mean by that 
and I apologize, I, I thought I turned off this other phone, but I guess I didn't. What I mean by that is if the device is already on the market and people are already using it for indication why, even though it's not part of an RCT, a randomized clinical trial, if that real world evidence passes the, the test, it's not just real world data, but real world evidence, we don't have to do an RCT necessarily. We can use that real world evidence to support the label expansion to get a new 510K or PMA or whatever it is. Exactly the same thing applies for, uh, for, for reimbursement. We can use, or at least we should consider using real world evidence, not necessarily real world data because there's a, there's a difference in the quality of those two things. It has to be reliable, it has to be reproducible and, and so on and so on. But we can consider using our real world evidence for reimbursement purposes, for reimbursement justification, if you will. It doesn't necessarily have to be in the traditional gold standard being the uh, randomized clinical trial. Uh, I think that's just very antiquated thinking. Uh, so that's sort of a, in, a, in a nutshell how I would differentiate between the two and what it has to do with reimbursement. Happy to go into that in more detail if anybody is interested. So if I understand you correctly, um using a flexible platform um, will give you in the future the opportunity to use real world evidence in order to ext extend uh, your reimbursement opportunities. I think so, yes, but maybe Daniel wants to add a little bit more about how the platform can actually do that. Yes, so basically uh, when talking about you know, value-based care and, and uh, how it affects reimbursement, uh, definitely, we see and, and see it all the time that reimbursement continues to uh, reform and, and change. Uh, and, and as a medical device manufacturer or as a care provider, uh, you need to be ready to support uh, future med methods and trends. Um, and when talking about uh, you know uh, value-based care, it's one of the leading trends today, uh, where you know providing supporting data and evidence uh, on treatment will become a crucial uh, part for uh, reimbursement pro purposes. Uh, instead of, you know, uh, randomized clinical trials or, or other elements. Uh, and it, uh, we see that it becomes more and more popular by, by payers and, and providers uh, uh, when it comes to supporting reimbursement requests. So uh, when talking again, putting it into the uh, context of connected care platform, uh, uh, it should provide you with the ability to collect all the data, all the needed evidence, uh, and uh, enable eventually a, a value-based care that will be used also for reimbursement. So things like, for example, um, uh, the indication of the improvement of the patient condition uh, by using PROMS, uh, patient reported out outcome models, and where you can ask the, uh, the, the patient questions after a treatment on how he feels, whether his condition improved or not. That in combination to the actual uh, objective data of the signs that you are collecting, um, and then, of course, if you can even uh, get, go further and, and prevent uh, 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 illnesses or uh, have improvements in the illnesses uh, via areas which are totally different, like adherence uh, uh, management and adherence prediction. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, provide personalized, ba personalized based care uh, based on adaptive algorithms that you are running. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, there are different in the outcome between different patients because no two patients are alike. Uh, so all of that, uh, and then bringing back the ability eventually to remotely real-time monitor the patient and provide diagnostics uh, uh, and, and uh, actions uh, in against to the changes in situation of the patient, uh, uh, and which eventually reduces re readmissions or ER visits or uh, any other uh, a more expensive uh, uh, treatment uh, should uh, eventually also uh, uh, be seen by the uh, payers and the providers as, as something that uh, they all care about promoting and eventually will also help you uh, to provide more value uh, to your customers. So um, as I understand the value-based care is potentially going to replace the fee-for-service uh, reimbursement. Um, taking uh, the patient holistic uh, approach, how are uh, physicians are going to be affected from uh, this change of uh, according? So um, I'll start with Mike, feel free to jump in. 
uh, again, that, that's my view and also some of the things that you already see. Uh, we see that the patient becomes more and more important in the process and, and uh, being, you know, starting to put his, his foot uh, uh, stronger and, and uh, asking for uh, uh, specific treatments and specific devices. Uh, and specific procedures. And, and if the, the care provider will not listen to the patient, uh, he will eventually uh, uh, ditch him and move to another uh, uh, physician to provide him the treatment that he's looking for. And, and they're all trying to go uh, and uh, get better uh, uh, treatments by uh, you know, uh, being treated at home or, or in places that they are feeling more comfortable or more safe than going to the hospital or to a clinic where they have many people uh, uh, which are sick at the same time. So uh, I think the, the trend is going towards that, that we would like to add more and more uh, 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 services uh, that you offer to your patient that improve his life and his, his experience. Uh, and if you can at the same time also generate additional revenues uh, revenue streams out of it, like, you know, by adding more features and functions to offer him uh, and that can be reimbursed. Um, like if you are a cardiovascular uh, a doctor and you are uh, providing him with a sleep test to do at home because it will help you to better uh, indicate his condition uh, on the CVD side uh, and he will gain from it because he doesn't need to go to a sleep lab, then uh, it's an interesting story to tell. Um, so if if I take everything you said up till now uh, and summarize it, um, I understand that reimbursement takes a lot of planning. And uh, Mike, you mentioned uh, earlier that uh, reimbursements require strategy. Can you elaborate a little bit about strategy and reimbursement? Yeah, happy to do so, Karen. Uh, bottom line, we have to take a holistic approach to the entire product development process. You can kind of think about it like different pieces of the puzzle, as you see on the slide now, that all need to be fit together to make one big picture. Reimbursement is one piece of that puzzle. Regulatory is another piece. Product development, product liability, intellectual property, uh, business development, and, and so on and so on. They're all different pieces of the puzzle. We need to consider them individually as components to understand them. And then we need to consider them kind of holistically as the big picture. And I've seen it happen many times and I could give a number of specific examples where what we want to say, for example, in our labeling uh, from a regulatory perspective is diametrically opposed, is 180 degrees out of sync from what we want to say from a reimbursement perspective or a product liability perspective or perhaps some other perspective. So it's really important that we take this holistic approach. It's kind of like um, you mentioned, uh, Karen, uh, strategy. I think that's the operative term here. You know, I characterize the entire relationship between the company and the FDA, and similarly between the company and CMS as a poker game in every sense of the word. And just because somebody understands the rules of poker doesn't necessarily mean they're going to uh, be a good poker player. Certainly doesn't mean that they're going to win the game. I want to do everything that I can legal, of course. I don't want to be wearing any orange jumpsuits in order to win the game. In other words, you can read 50 books on the rules of poker. Does that mean that you're going to be a good poker player? Does that mean that you're going to win the game? Absolutely not. So I think it's very important to emphasize that um, none of us, myself included, can be experts in all of these different pieces. That goes without saying, but it's really important when you're uh, assessing your team, if you already have a team or you're building a new team, that you make sure that you get people on your team that are going to be uh, subject matter experts in these areas in each of these different pieces of the puzzle so that you can take that holistic approach. And when it comes to things like uh, FDA, you can avoid all too common scenarios where the device is delayed from getting onto the market, or in some cases, you can't get it through the FDA and onto the market. From a reimbursement perspective, as I said later, you can avoid or at the very least greatly mitigate the chances of getting your device through the FDA and onto the market, only to come to find that people can't use it because they can't buy it because you can't get reimbursement for it. It's unfortunate, Karen, how often these kinds of problems happen, not just to small companies, but sometimes to the largest medical device companies on earth. And I hate to say it, but I just laugh when I see these things happen because 
This is just an elementary school mistake. And you can greatly minimize, if not completely avoid these problems uh, by taking this holistic approach. I don't know, Daniel, maybe I'm a little naive. Maybe I fell up the, the turnip truck yesterday. Maybe you would have an alternative suggestion, but that's my, uh, my naive view of the world. What do you think? No, I think I'll just add a few uh, points to that. that uh, I believe that, you know, eventually, whatever you choose you, you, uh, and you think you, is the right way to move forward, you will, you will learn throughout the way that you did some mistakes and, and you will need to uh, uh, fix, you know, uh, and, and modify uh, and adjust. And, and uh, uh, my take is that you, you need to have, you know, uh, supporting tools and platforms that will enable you to easily modify and change and, and get, you know, uh, yourself ready for, for, the, for fixing the mistakes uh, that you did because you will make mistakes and, and uh, you will have to uh, fix them. So looking at what I have taken from those 50 minutes is that uh, reimbursement, development, and regulation is complicated uh, and uh, required uh, taking advices and, uh, from experts. Uh, Daniel, uh, can you help us understand how you can reduce a little bit the complexity of, uh, of connecting medical devices um, and, and uh, simplify just a little bit of this uh, entire complicated process? So I know that we are short in time. We only have six more minutes left. So I want to respect the time of all the people who have joined us. So I, would not, I want to leave time for questions. And there are some questions that they are in, in the Q&A. Um, uh, so I invite anyone that wants to learn more about BioT and what we are doing and how we support reimbursement to contact us after the uh, webinar and I'll be happy to address those questions and we'll share the presentation slide so you can also look what's in it. Let's keep the, uh, uh, the channel open for the next five or six minutes for Q&A uh, and anyone that wants can you, you know, jump to our website and we have a free trial there that you can uh, Leave your details and we'll get back to you and, and uh, open for you an account to play with the system. So um, let's move to the Q&A. Okay, so there are quite a few questions and I will try to summarize a few of them into uh, one. Um, regarding real world evidence, um, can you elaborate a little bit about data collection and qualification? Daniel, so, do you want to say anything about that or, sh or should I? I start? will start on the first part on the data collection side. Basically, once you uh, uh, monitor uh, all the devices that you have, uh, then uh, you, you collect all the information coming from the patient side, uh, both, again, as I mentioned, the objective data, which is the uh, data coming from the device uh, about the treatment of the patient, uh, and also the uh, subjective data uh, that comes in either from the patient itself by answering questions, or by managing his diary, or by the physician that is adding his details, or by uh, enriching the data from third-party systems uh, uh, like medical records and so on. So all of that is, is basically uh, the, the, the building blocks of the data collection part. Thank you, Daniel. Another question. Um, you say, you mentioned, uh, Mike, that uh, it will be better if we start as early as possible planning the the uh, reimbursement um, of the device uh, taking consideration and uh, but medical devices development takes years sometimes and once you get to the point they are ready uh, to be deployed uh, reimbursement can change um, is there a way um, Daniel maybe you have a, uh, you can offer us a way to overcome it and reduce the the risk of changes in reimbursement? So um, again, uh, it, it's all about, uh, it, it's very difficult to answer the question, uh, uh, you know, because you don't know exactly what kind of changes will happen and what kind of risks you will have to uh, uh, address at the end of the day. Um, but uh, the, the main thing I, I would like to emphasize here again is that uh, the, the way to reduce risk is, is by utilizing uh, as much as possible uh, solutions which are out of the box, that are out there and that you can integrate uh, to your platform and to your solution, uh, hopefully in a SaaS model. So eventually 
if you didn't do, do need to fix things and, 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 and change strategies, the overall cost uh, will not be dramatic uh, for doing those changes. Rather than you know developing a one-off solution uh, from scratch and then uh, throwing all the development that you did uh, away and, and starting from, from the beginning. And if I could just add very briefly, um, Karen, uh, you said that you know medical device development can take years. In some cases, yes, that is true, but I think it's important not to overgeneralize. So obviously, if you're developing a very complicated device like a totally implantable artificial heart, that can take years or even decades to develop. On the other hand, if you're developing a Band-Aid or better, you know, an SAMD, a software as a medical device, an app, for example, that might take weeks, days, maybe even hours to develop. So uh, we have to be a little bit careful. But more importantly, um, you ask a good question about change. Well, change is constant. Our world is constantly changing, the reimbursement world and the regulatory world included. The best advice I can give, and I give this to, uh, advice to companies every single day of the week, we have to evaluate the options that we have today and make the, the best decisions that we have today. And then we have to reevaluate from them from time to time in the future. And if and when things change, as my attorney friends always say, I reserve the right to change my opinion as I learn more information, then we make modifications to the change uh, to, to our plan you know, as we move forward. But if we take that, uh, and I'm not suggesting that this was the intent of your question, Karen, but if we use that as an excuse not to do anything, then you know, people wouldn't get out of bed in the morning. right? So we have to make the best decisions that we can given the environment that we live in today. If and when the environment changes, we might make a, a, an appropriate change at that point. That's my uh, my response to that question. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, there are a few more questions which I don't think we have time. Uh, I see Rachel already smiling, so I don't have we have enough time to answer them. Um, okay, collect them and then answer uh, you know directly to the people that ask them after the event. Yeah, we will. So thank you both. And Rachel, uh, back to you. You are mute. Thank you. Yes. Uh, can I, so what we can also do is uh, make sure that the panelists get these questions uh, additionally after the program, and they will have contact information that you use to register so they can actually answer your questions later as well. So we will make sure that they get the transcript of any question uh, that was not able to be answered in real time. So I just want to say thank you again to our excellent speakers and to BioT for putting this together. What a fantastic program. Um, for everyone still on the line, the program is recorded and you will be receiving a copy of that video so that you can view it on YouTube at any time. So thank you, Daniel, Michael, Karen. You guys are wonderful and I appreciate your support on this. Thank, thank you. you. And your thank you, everybody. Everyone have a wonderful rest of your day.